Good evening and welcome to the City of Helena City Administrative Meeting. This meeting is called to order. Welcome and thank you for participating in the City of Helena City Commission Administrative Meeting. We are pleased to be able to provide this alternative meeting format in the city's effort to broaden public participation. Please be patient as we may experience technical difficulties during the meeting. We welcome your public commentary. Please read the following tips and guidelines for the app usage and your participation. Madam Clerk, would you take the roll, please? Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I believe we're still waiting on um, representative from the city attorney's office to join us. Um, and I do not see the city manager on quite yet either. Um, so I'll move forward with the commission. Commissioner Dean? Here. Commissioner Fever. Here. Commissioner Reed. Here. Commissioner Logan. Here. Mayor Collins. Here. Uh, and for the record, I see uh, the city manager on at this time. Okay. I do not see the uh, city attorney as of yet. Okay, we'll give them another minute or so. It's nice to see you, Wilma. I hope you're doing well. Nice, bright, sunny day. Wind's blowing a little hard, but you know, it's 50 degrees out there, and all that snow that you like so much is just going away. Going away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Commission of Fever. Well, I just thought I'd point it out. I mean, I'm I hear you. I appreciate that. I appreciate the greetings. <laughs> Madam Clerk, do we have the attorney? We will move on. And um, if there's anything, we will look at it. <clears throat> okay. Commission comments, questions. Any comments, discussions from the commission? I see here Parks Bowl recommendation. Commissioner Logan, you have Mr. to- Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, you know, Mr. Mayor, as you know, I'm an ex officio representative of our commission on the City County Parks Board. And during our January meeting, the next steps of considering the idea for a regional parks district were discussed. And as part of that discussion, Mary Hollow of the Prickly Pear Land Trust informed the board that the Trust for Public Lands has offered to pay for and run a poll to obtain information about a mechanism for the regional management of resources. And one that looks at funding mechanisms related to those resources. I think it's important to understand that the Trust for Public Lands there out of Bozeman, uh, they can pursue this polling independent of city and county commissions, but I think they were wanting the support of both bodies before going to the public. So the city county parks board passed a motion to recommend to both the city and county commissions that they pursue the free polling through the trust for public lands. Subsequently, a little later in the month, uh, Parks Director Pinozo sent out an email to the manager reflecting that motion or communicating that motion and, and pointed toward getting it on a future agenda. Also in, included in that uh, email was a draft technical assistance letter for the commission's uh, our consideration. I think the idea at that point was that Perhaps I, as the representative, would bring this recommended motion and the technical assistance draft forward for consideration at today's meeting. Well, in the meantime, that technical assistance letter has been seen, supported, and signed by all members of the commission except myself. And I guess I, today's purpose is like to take a minute and publicly explain why. Um, so some of these concerns were those expressed at the Parks Board meeting in addition to my own views. And, and I think while the intent of the polling is a good thing, I believe it needs to accurately reflect the concepts that are referenced in the feasibility study. If we are talking about 
a regional parks district. In the feasibility study that was completed by the Helena Parks Department six years or so ago. And I would say that the survey needs to broadly address all recreational facilities, amenities and services that would be part of a parks district, not just open space trails and conservation priorities. At the January meeting of the Parks Board, there was concern that the survey questions should be developed with the input. Again, if we're speaking in the context of a regional parks district, should be developed with the input of representatives from all community parks and recreation stakeholders and perhaps representation from the City County Parks Board. My thoughts were given the public sector nature of any future parks district, it's my opinion that that park board should be very involved in the development of that survey. If the focus of this survey is just for trails, open space and conservation priorities, then that the name of the survey or how it goes out should be reflected toward a potential open space bond and not be pointed toward a regional parks district. If the main intent of the survey is to focus on open space issues, then call it an open space survey. My concern or my fear is that if not messaged correctly, that survey effort could negatively affect the potential source or success of a regional parks district, which is likely will be the most effective and sustainable mechanism of meeting existing and future recreation and parks needs. And I feel strongly that as written, that letter potentially leaves out many of the assets and stakeholders needed in a broader regional parks district. Between the city's natural parks, federal public lands, Helena has amazing access to open space. Helena does not have enough access and opportunities to basic recreation facility, facilities such as an indoor swimming pool, sports fields, gym space and other amenities. And I guess, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to sort of explain publicly why I chose not to sign that particular letter. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks for your explanation. <clears throat> Recommendations from Helena Citizens Council, Representative Karen Wilson, you have the floor. You have the floor, Karen. Hi, this is Karen. Um, yes, I have a update and um, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. We had our uh, first meeting in January for our oath of office. And we also um, have all been signing up to attend commission meetings. And uh, when we meet in February, we will start um, listing out some of our priorities for the year but we are all invested in uh, listening to what's going on in the city and the work that you're doing and providing input as we are able to. And so we understand there's several very um, important uh, topics up like the issue around housing and such. And so we do wanna reach out to each of our districts to get um, recommendations and we are in the, in the beginning stages of the work for this year, but we're off to a good start. So that is my report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. City Manager's report, Manager Hollishaw. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon. <laughs> it is a great set of uh, sun, Sunny day outside, uh, Commissioner Fever. It's so nice to see the sun. I agree with you. The um, potential of all of those icebergs also melting is so nice. <laughs> so the, uh, today, this afternoon, I wanted to um, make sure and share to you the, uh, the Q2, so that's quarter two work plan. So we're in a, um, a particular uh, budget cycle and we've tied our uh, our, our FY23, excuse me, FY22 fiscal year 22 budget cycle includes the work plan. And this is the first year that a work plan has been uh, put together. So really, uh, I want to start communicating with you all 
the interconnection of the work we do as well as the amount of funding we spend so that you can see more clearly the connection of the work to the outcomes and then also how we're watching spending in relationship to activity. So I'll first turn it over to Commissioner Danielson, or excuse me, uh, Finance Director <laughs> Danielson and uh, Zach, who are our, is our projects coordinator, to, and um, excuse me, not projects coordinator, I apologize, budget officer, <laughs> so that he, the two of them can provide an update um, to you both, and we'll come back to me at the end for the um, work plan, and which will transition into the training. So thank you. Thank you, City Manager Holishak. Um, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, if the City Clerk will allow, I will share my screen and um, uh, go through my presentation. Thank you. Um, so this is a mid-year fiscal um, 22 financial update. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I have just gone to the next slide, so I just want to make sure my slide is um, scrolling. Can you confirm? Yes, it is. Great. Thank you. Um, so just as just a recap of our fiscal 22 budget, we budgeted uh, $95 million in revenue and adopted $97.7 .7 million in expenditures. Um, uh, with a, a $2.2 million coming from our reserves. In the general fund, um, we adopted 24 million in revenue and uh, appropriated 28 million and used 4.2 million in reserves. Our special revenue funds, which include like our streets maintenance funds, um, open space, open lands, um, civic center facilities um, funds or fall into those special revenue funds. We budgeted 26.4 million in revenue and we adopted 24.9 million in appropriations. And our enterprise funds, which are business, our funds such as the water, wastewater fund, um, transfer station, transit, um, parking, those are uh, golf, those are all enterprise funds. Those combined, we adopted 31 million in revenue and um, 31.06 million in appropriations with almost just a break even for those types of funds. Um, for the um, explanation on the general fund reserves that we used, last year we budgeted to use 4.2 million in reserves in the general fund. That encompassed um, several large um, outlays such as our uh, ERP, financial um, software conversion. Um, we transferred $235,000 to the golf course for debt service. Um, we had some one-time consulting projects that we budgeted for police radios and some deferred maintenance in the parks um, departments. And I'm sorry, was there a question? Yes, yeah, sorry, Sheila. I just wanted to ask a quick question before you move off of this. Um, were these when you you call them reserves, were they actually the general? Did they include the general fund savings as a result of the CARES? Is that also included in these dollars? Yes. Thank you. Yes. So we did designate. Um, so what went into reserves from the prior fiscal year did encompass a lot of savings from CARES fund dollars that that were allocated. And those CARES fund dollars were allocated one to the ERP software conversion for $1.5 million among like the police riddles and, and other types of costs that were, were had the opportunity for those one-time dollar expenditure, expenditures from CARES fund savings in the general fund. And um, so with that, then we, you know, out of that 3.5, that mostly was coming from those CARES fund savings um, in the general fund. We've uh, been working on some resiliency items um, that we noted that we would do in our work plan, um, such as uh, updating the general fund overhead cost recovery model. Um, we're developing a revenue um, manual development where we're outlining um, methodologies for assessments and fees. Um, we're working on continuing to update our budget policy policies, and this year we'll be focusing on um, new policies to add to that, one of which is um, our policies to subsidize other funds and activities. Um, 
I am uh, committed to making more regular financial reports to the commission, such as this one. Um, our human resources department has been very busy this year doing salaries and benefits analysis. Um, our uh, public works director is working on a uh, water sewer rate study with his team. Um, at the Gulf Fund, they hired a new operations manager um, and he's doing great work out there and reviewing um, operations and efficiencies and looking at cost and revenue analysis out there. And this year, we also have the task of administrating our ARPA funds. Go back here. So just as an overall snapshot on our city revenue, um, through December, this is through December, we collected about 42% of our budgeted revenue. Um, you can see that a lot of uh, that is um, um, the deficiency of, of, of halfway is in our taxes. Um, although in January, we did collect about $5 million more in taxes and assessments. So they use, those tax payments usually come um, in about four lump sum payments, a big chunk in December, um, a little bit more in January, and then later in the year, we get the, we get the balance of those tax assessments in kind of two lump sums as they collect them and process them, then the county forwards them to the city. Um, other uh, um, areas that we haven't quite um, um, utilized our full budget capacity is in other financing, and other financing is really um, loans, contributions, reimbursements, and we had budgeted for some uh, pretty pretty large loans, both in um, the streets assessment fund, streets maintenance fund, and also in the water sewer um, funds. And we have not yet to date taken out those loans. Our charges and services, um, I'm gonna move to this next, um, nope, our charges and services are, are well above um, what, what we uh, had, had anticipated at the half year mark. However, we had um, most of our water um, metered sales that came in um, due to the dry, hot, long summer. Um, we're at about 88% of what we budgeted for, for water meter sales. Um, sewer charges are about 75% of what um, uh, we to in total budgeted. And then um, transfer station fees are at about 58%. So that encompasses those long you know, summer months where those types of charges are a little bit higher. And then as we go into the month, winter months, they, they tend to be at a little bit lower. So um, my anticipation is that those types of revenues will continue to maintain st stability. And then um, the, whereas the taxes and assessments and those types of, of charges will ramp up in the second half of the year. Um, just as a, a recap to our revenue, um, we had adopted $95 million in revenue. We did um, a bunch of carryovers that came to the commission um, as, as uh, information and, and about 4.8 million. We've had some budget adjustments that are based on um, either fees, reimbursements or cost recovery at about 391,000. So our revised and amended budget uh, right now is 100,725,000 for revenue. I've broken down um, our revenue to uh, um, a trend line. Again, we're at about 42%, but I explained that a lot of that has to do with um, other financing sources and taxes and assessments coming in in the second half of the year or um, uh, reevaluating whether we need those or are going to take some of those loans in the current fiscal year. Um, on a year-to-date basis, this is kind of demonstrated as well. You can see our taxes are at about 47, 40% collected. Again, we got a big chunk of money in, in January, which put us at about that 50% mark. Um, you'll look over to the other financing column. We're only at about 21%. That's, again, loans um, and uh, um, grants, et cetera, that we may... Um, beginning in the second half of the year and charges for services again represent a lot of those big chunk of those water metered sales and sewer charges that um, we we collected in the first half of the year where we'll level off in the second half of the year. Um, this just gives a picture of um, you know the different types of revenue um, associated for the general fund. Um, you know the biggest transfers in are um, usually scheduled um, 
throughout the year. However, um, some of those some of those transfers are yet to happen in the second half of the year. Um, the rest of everything is looking pretty good. Again, taxes and assessments. We got about another five million um, in this in the in January. Our special revenue funds. The biggest deficit you can see is in um, again our assessments. Um, still waiting for the second half of the year and our intergovernmental revenue. Intergovernmental revenue represents again state shared revenue. Um, county payments to the city, which we hadn't received yet for some assessments, which we got in January and um, state shared revenue that um, came in January as well. Our enterprise funds, the uh, biggest, biggest uh, um, uh, gap here also is in this other financing that we haven't taken out those loans. We budgeted 5.9, we've only, um, um, gone out for 565,000 um, in other financing. And just in things and areas to watch for revenues, we're just, you know, continue to monitor our, whether our taxes and assessments are coming in. I think they are um, having gone through January now, looking at that, I'm comfortable with those intergovernmental revenue, making sure that um, we're uh, assessing whether or not we're getting the payments that we anticipated. Um, our state shared revenue and um, also looking at whether or not we're going to be taking the loans that we had anticipated. Um, I know that uh, the golf course manager operations manager is, is um, really looking at the golf revenue and operations and focusing in on that. Um, Civic Center event sales to date are doing fine. Um, they did get that grant for $350,000, which really helped um, for their revenue losses that they suffered in the prior couple of years due to the pandemic. And we continue to monitor parking revenue. Right now it's doing okay, but it's just something that um, the transportation services director and his team continue to look at. On the expense side, um, we're at about 35%. And most of that, as you can see, is capital outlay um, where, where we're under. Um, again, we um, anticipate the construction season to be starting up again in the spring, which will bring that capital outlay um, expenditures up and, and more in line with what we budgeted. Um, our debt service, we um, make a big, a fairly large principal payment in January. So through December, it doesn't look like we've spent, you know, what, what we had budgeted, but it's, we're at about half what we budgeted for um, debt service payments. And then special revenue funds that encompasses um, a large capital as well because our street maintenance fund is in there and they haven't um, expended all their, their uh, capital resources that they, they budgeted for as of yet to date. Um, as a, as a um, recap of our, our budget appropriations, we had originally appropriated 97 million we had um, about 24 million in carryover and I listed it out by funds. You can see streets funds was at about 4.4 million in a carryover. Gas tax fund, which is also street maintenance related is 1.5 million. And water, wastewater and solid waste were you know, 13 million in carryovers. So they make up most of the carryovers that uh, were approved or that were uh, um, uh, processed earlier in this year. And then we had some budget adjustments related to fees. So our revised amended appropriations right now are at 122 million. The total expense trend, you can see we're at right now at about 35% of budget. I just recapped that. Um, you can see our amended budget um, as compared to our unaudited is um, 122, our unaudited expenditures are expected to be about 79 million for fiscal 21. We're still uh, finalizing that audit and should be wrapped up this month. Go here. Um, this represents the areas that you can see where we have not spent, um, you know, kind of at the halfway mark where you would expect, especially in um, our capital outlay, which makes um, a pretty big chunk of our expenditures. And we're only at about 15% of our capital outlay costs at this time. Um, but, and then intracity charges, intracity charges um, also include ITNS charges, and we had not been billed for those um, through December. We did make um, a fairly large payment to them and caught up 
um, with their, in, they caught up with their invoicing in January and we, we submitted um, our ITNS payments to them, which were um, close to half a million dollars in January. Um, if you look at our expenses by type, our, our uh, salaries and wages are about on target. Um, and this includes that stipend and, and an uh, additional payday. We had one additional payday in December that gets counted in here. So we're about on target with our personnel services. Um, and um, if you look to the capital outlay, again, that's kind of the big chunk of why we're not um, at the halfway mark, we budgeted 43 million in, in capital outlay and we've only spent 6.4 million year to date. This is just a snapshot of if we were looking at um, a budget year to date through the general fund, um, we're fairly you know, on target with the exception of purchase services. Um, those are you know, intermittent and a lot of those um, costs are scheduled for the second half of the year and special revenue funds. Again, it's mostly capital outlay if we were to look at it on a year-to-date basis to a year-to-date budget. Um, year-to-date, it would have been, we would have, you know, if you cut it in half, we would have spent nine, but we've only spent 2 million in, in capital outlay, but other expenditures are pretty much on target where we had budgeted. And the enterprise funds, again, same, same scenario as the uh, special revenue funds where if you cut the year in half, um, we would we would have said we'd had 10 million in capital outlay, but we've only expended 4 million. All the other categories are a little bit uh, are are in line with what what I anticipated our budget would be. Um, again, the areas to watch in expenses, I think at this point, are just our capital outlay and determining whether or not um, a lot of those expenditures are going to happen. Um, some may or may not. Um, I know that there's construction delays, there's um, labor shortages, there's uh, material delays, and um, was just informed by our transportation team that um, that vendors are adding surcharges to costs now. So it's uh, you know it all falls in line with that inflation um, and where we're going to end up for the end of the year. But as of today, I think we'll we'll be okay. There are just a couple of items that uh, we will likely be bringing forward to the commission as budget amendments. Um, and these are uh, based on reimbursements, primarily $800,000 uh, Law and Justice Center improvements. That's primarily the second floor of the um, Law and Justice Center and then remaining build out um, for um, code requirements to be able to occupy the second floor. Um, those that'll be funded through um, rents and, and payments from both the city and the county, along with the CCAB improvements. So it was a carryover. Um, our liability insurance this year is, a, is an internal service fund. Um, it came in much higher, about $200,000 higher than, than I had anticipated our liability insurance to come in at. So um, we'll be using reserves that fund has adequate reserves to make that payment, but coming in the next fiscal year, I'm gonna to have to increase the allocations to the other funds um, due to an anticipate, anticipated um, you know, increase again in liability insurance. Um, we um, had $100,000 in redevelopment agency funds that um, didn't get carried over that we'll be asking to carry over through a budget amendment. Um, the $129,000 in sidewalk funding, um, that was just a, a timing delay. Um, this is for uh, the fiscal 21 sidewalk program that actually we didn't get all those invoices until fiscal 22. And so we had to pay out those invoices for that program. And because we had that, we didn't have any appropriations in that fund because we had um, wanted to shift the sidewalk program into the streets maintenance fund. And so I just need a budget adjustment to, to pay for the outlay of the sidewalk um, costs that happened. And we'll be coming forward with ARPA fund um, budget amendments. And there was just a, a timing delay in the CDBG fund. There was a $9,000 um, late invoice that got processed in fiscal 22. So um, we'll be asking for a budget amendment for that as well. And at this point, I am open for any questions that any of you have regarding the financial update.
Thank you, Director Danielson. Do we have any questions or comments from the um, commission? Mr. Mayor, I have a couple, if that's okay. Please. Um, I guess the first one, do we know why the liability insurance was so much higher? Thank you, Commissioner Dean. Um, I, I don't. And, you know, I have to be honest with you. Um, I didn't, you know, as I was going through the budget last year, I didn't have an opportunity to really delve into what our claims were. It's primarily, I mean, our insurance will go up based on claims processed. And this year I have a little bit, I have a better grasp of what types of claims are being filed against the city. And that does impact our, our liability insurance. Okay. That's helpful. Um, and then I just two other questions. Um, one, and this doesn't necessarily need an answer today, but, um, I'm curious if maybe once we get closer to like March or when we start having some more of these budget discussions, if we can get kind of a sneak peek of what might be getting carried over um, into the next fiscal year. Um, and then my other question is, I know that there have been previous discussions of, um, you know, a kind of updated longer term or strategic CIP process or consideration of how we're, we're budgeting for our capital improvement plan. Um, and so I'm wondering if you have any updates on that or how might, that might impact what we're looking at now and then heading into the budget season. Thank you. Those are excellent questions. And um, I have been working with um, a team um, inclusive of um, the city manager's office on developing a capital improvement policy. Um, we are still uh, kind of working out some of the details with that. We shared that information with the directors to get their feedback. Um, on it just last week. And so we're incorporating that feedback and um, we'll be working toward bringing um, a policy to the commission for review. The bigger picture I, I'll just add to um, specific to the capital improvement program is a relationship to the work plan. And because we haven't had a strategic um, capital improvement program, they are just actions um, mixed in with actual work. So. Uh, the nice part of the capital improvement plan is to pull out those larger investments that will have a, a significant impact to the budget and, and concentrate on those. Also to integrate those legacy projects that have not been or sh really shown um, within our budgets year to year. So um, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, uh, the, the facility, the, the heated storage facility, it continues to move forward, but it's not really pulled out and you don't know how much total dollar is set aside for it in the long run in that larger group of capital improvement projects so that you can reprioritize them. So that would be the intention is to come to you all, not only with the policy, but in the years following and the next year, we'll be following with the actual projects so you can begin to prioritize which ones you want as a commission to move forward in which you want to um, put on pause or reprioritize. Thank you, Manager Halshock and Director, Director Danielson. Do we have any other questions from the commission? I see Commissioner Fever lips are moving, but he's on, he's muted. So I don't know if he's trying to talk to us or not. I have a family. My family oh. every now and then asks me questions and I try to answer them. So I will stop. Oh, sorry. Any other co comments? If not, we'll move along to uh, City Commission Orientation, City Manager Holloshaw. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm going to finish the, the second part of the uh, first item really quickly, and that's on the work plan uh, as well. So the integration of the work plan next to the spending is important so that you can see how close we are in relationship to spending and the actions that the budget called out that we would be doing this year. So you should have a copy of the work plan with you. I just wanted to highlight uh, already, just wanted to highlight some, some key areas for you. Um, I, I think they're important at this point to share uh, some quick updates and then ask you if you have any questions. Um, first, I wanted to highlight the... Um, uh, 
the regional parks district. I know that this was brought up just a, a moment ago um, by uh, you all and Commissioner Logan had um, you all had signed on to the letter. Commissioner Logan noted his concerns. Uh, I do think it'd be a, worth a conversation among the commission as you get into the budget uh, to contemplate what future asks could be of the voters in the community and your priorities in particular thinking about not only the recreation district and uh, carve out specific for open lands but also with respect to potentially um, items for the fire department based on whatever comes in from sir from um, from those um, from the the research being done by the fire department as well as the public safety um, tax and within the police department as we bring forward any budget items through the salaries piece. I just wanted to flag that for you, knowing that many of you have, have uh, agreed to, um, to that sign on. I just wanted to make sure and flag that those are potential conversations coming that you may want to start contemplating that priority on. We also had the on the work plan and actual um, implementation project. And I, I think it's also worth um, the actual strategy itself, which are, uh, Director Pinozo is working on. Those elements of activity this year may be a good opportunity to revisit whether or not um, the commission is, is wanting to continue forward separate or in, con, in relationship to the Parks District. It is a really difficult conversation to, to start when the county isn't really signed on. So we're still in that place where we understand that the recreation district itself is not something that the county is in agreement with. I also understand in talks with um, uh, Roger Baltz, the administrator, that their agreement with the prickly pear was a narrow edging of saying that they aren't necessarily for or against, but instead the polling was specific to, hey, would you be interested in, um, instead of the county supports this kind of increase in its poll. So just wanted to make sure, I'm not sure if that, that had been clear to you all, but there isn't the intention with the county in their support that there was some additional layer of only supporting conservation. Um, just one that was, was shared to by Roger as well. Um, and if you have any questions on that, I, I can certainly answer those after I just finish out these quick updates. Um, we are working with a team internally on our permits for special events and, and uh, parades. That includes the pride permit uh, for the pride uh, events. I know that there was questions about how um, we're revising the ordinances and so forth. We really feel like we have the capability within our permitting system and we'll be done soon uh, with integrating and making it far easier. What what really shines out in this process is that we've been using one permit to do multiple things and that creates more confusion. So the team is really contemplating what we're asking people to fill out when they do events and parades. The, uh, a couple of projects, we are looking at um, construction projects where this, uh, there could be potential funding impacts on um, some of the bonding that we do and some of the loans that we may take based on any sorts of um, larger picture um, policies, um, excuse me, projects and loans against the street assessment in particular are on hold as we're uh, looking at a challenge on it and we're really looking at other ideas. I know that um, our city attorney will be sharing more on Monday with the community and with you all around that um, in the bigger picture, but I wanted you to know that we are really working on other ways that we can fund these projects and get them continuing forward. Um, last, um, artificial turf. So one of the <laughs> one of the projects that um, you'll see there's very uh, low movement on is our artificial turf. Uh, that was suggested and recommended at Kendrick. The commission required the staff uh, uh, try and achieve some sort of leasing agreement and. Um, by one of the, the leagues. They did not agree to that. And as a result, it is not being funded. We only have $125,000 set aside. 
we anticipate that costs have gone up. As we get closer to end of, um, end of this winter season and start to look at pricing, we anticipate that already that, uh, that turf has gone up because we couldn't order it. So uh, just as a flag, it may be something that we come back to you and say, hey, we, we're going, I know the commission absolutely did not agree with funding at 100%. And uh, given that one of the leagues has not actually signed on, we would like to fund it and it actually may go up. So I'll ask the team to bring forward that dollar amount that is the new or revision um, so that you have that information and we can talk about it at a commission meeting so that um, you all can have a final decision. Now the last part is the culture survey and the, uh, the climate survey the, uh, within the staff. The, um, the actual data is not something I'll be giving out, but I can give you the highlights. And I think that's really important for you to, to understand some of the highlights of what we learned in October. Um, the staff completed a survey and analyzed. Um, we really sat down and listened to them and were analyzing the training, engagement, safety, and then um, what we're like as an employer. Based on those, uh, the results of that survey, uh, we're really just not surprised. I, I'm very thankful for the input from the uh, from the staff. 60% um, participated, and normal amount of participation is around 30%. I, I believe that it's uh, in relationship to the support um, they have shown in that in that survey around um, being engaged with their work, and also they they noted some just other big high level achievements um, and agreement with us that the, they're keeping up with their licenses and by way of training and that the safety in the workplace is is very much taken seriously by the city and that um, staff and other departments are cooperative and working together so that's really great things um, and really does represent that team environment that I've been really encouraging um, some areas that we're going to be working on really do relate to this this larger conversation around compensation that we've been having um, even as a nation really and uh, one at the um, city oh thank you um, I have the screen share I'm just going to share with you a, a high level um, and I'll also send this out to you all it's a it's infographic of a recent analysis of the Great Recession and the Great Resignation, excuse me, the Great Resignation. And it was done by Mission Square Research and it was focused on public employees, public sector employees, and those in their jobs. And, and notably, the interest um, specifically in change in jobs, retirement, and uh, leaving the workforce. So I thought I would share these, these key points because they actually translate similarly to the city of Helena. So what are the big three reasons that are, uh, that are impacts to the, uh, the staff are actually not all that uncommon in our sector. So um, want a higher salary or a better benefits package. They feel burned out and they need li a work life um, balance. Those are all things that I think we've all heard and had conversations around even coming up to this meeting. Um, what I really found interesting was that this, this real focus, which I believe, on, and I'm going to sh share to you next, that um, there's a difference between reducing stress and retaining employees. And so the reducing stress is you know, providing salary increases and hiring more people to reverse reduce workload, along with that emotional support. But really, the, the larger picture is this offering of improved salaries and showing more appreciation for employees and recognition for what they do. Um, in our own culture analysis and, and re response from the team, um, what they shared was that um, our training program citywide dropped off in 2019 and it totally went to fund. So we have not had a citywide training program. And really specifically, our um, supervisors and emerging leaders really have not been provided opportunity to grow. Uh, we've hired the Center for Creative Leadership to help us complete a gap analysis for our supervisors and our leaders to help narrow in on the type of training that will support them in their growth and also 
as leaders. And as well, after that's done, we'll go to the same kinds of uh, analysis and, and gap analysis for our staff who will need to um, support those, those larger emerging leaders so we can continue to really build that, that pipeline of, of team who stays. Uh, our pay, we've been talking, um, I know last time we had our administrative meeting, we've been talking about pay in relationship to the minimum wage and the $9 minimum wage and the impact of a $15 minimum wage based on um, the actual living wage. So that $15 living wage is the wage was that was informed based on 2019 data. Total compensation is viewed, and I really want to start having a conversation around total compensation, not just salary, but salary, benefits, training, schedule, and stability. So those all of those elements create a total compensation in our, in relationship not only to that that minimum wage. So we I, I know uh, Mayor and um, Commissioner Dean had asked questions about the um, I think actually the mayor around the the dollars and the minimum wage and what the impact would be to the overall uh, matrix. That is something we are building into the budget. All of this work that I'm describing that's future work will be integrated into the budget. And that's, I just want to make sure that you're um, seeing how the work plan and our budget updates and budget information are informing each other so that when we get in front of you with a budget we're actually providing you with the detail that you need but the 21 percent 21.3 percent wage differential is really what what shows itself out um, as being the impact of a nine moving from a nine dollar minimum wage and then uh, applying a 15 dollar living wage minimum living minimum wage across the matrix and again that was from 2019. so our benefits are also being analyzed our benefit package actually has a pretty significant impact on families and we've lost um, significant we've had a significant impact because of that that um, benefit package really not being fair for our families that is something that um, renee will be bringing forward towards this budget cycle and then last on the communication side, this is the, the third area we really need to be working on, and that's communications internally. While it has gotten better, and it was far better than it was in the past, we, we still have a need to continue the communications out to our, to our team members. And mostly, the first step was trying to ensure that everyone had access to email. A lot of our team members didn't actually have access. So that's that's been taken care of, and we're also integrating advice and we'll be seeking advice from our advisory team the city uh, formed in relationship in, to human resources and advisory team we haven't had one before across all of the departments to help advise on pay and benefits and um, also communications so wanted to, to make sure that you know so those are the the big three things that we'll be working on training really emerging leaders and our lead and our supervisors pay and making our total compensation package look better to make us com uh, competitive and then last communications internally. Um, communications also includes a mission. The city of Helena doesn't have a mission, uh, the departments do. Uh, by way of our operations, we don't have one, so we'll be wanting to talk about that. And as well, the, you know, the pillars of our culture, we'll be talking about those as well. Not so different than what our directors really had said from their retreat, which is that the, um, we need to stabilize our staff and doing that is really related to pay and benefits. And, and doing that, um, we will be far ahead of um, where we are today. And I'm, I'm really confident in the information and the work being done by the team and look forward to bringing to you our, our budget work, which will begin soon. I know um, we're all very excited. No one's, no one's clapping, no, no applause. But uh, I won't be sharing out, uh, like I said, I won't be sharing out the, the uh, um, lower level detail. I really want to respect and appreciate all of the anonymity um, that was brought to the table and ensuring that the employees felt comfortable providing all the impact, all the input that they could. Um, but I think it's also important that you know those bigger level, um, uh, higher level outcomes and, and activities that we'll be working on. And those are things that um, I confirmed we're okay to share. <laughs> the last um, next place I wanted to turn to is moving into the um, orientation and the, and the onboarding of the new commissioners and quickly getting through the city manager's items. 
before I do that, do you have any other questions specific to the work plan? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I, I have some, a question or two. Please go ahead. So um, first is a simple one. I didn't quite catch it all. The three components or three priorities you're bringing forward are training, compensation, and what's the other? Communications, internal. Communication. Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate that. I just kind of dropped it. Okay. When you talk about 21% across the matrix, that's for folks that you are raising from or want to raise from $9.20 to $15 an hour, or that's what actually happens when you raise folks to $9.20 an hour uh, and their existing matrices take care of, well, they grow. Um, so which, are the, which is that? Correct. It, it is the latter. So when, you, when we move and adjust the pay matrix to, comp, uh, to address that new $15 minimum, that is the ripple effect of, of that change. But nobody is receiving now who was at below minimum wage, you know, the old minimum wage. No one moved to $15 an hour on base. Um, they may have potentially if they were in a uh, in a uh, employment situation where they were already, um, you know, making more than nine dollars and twenty cents an hour, um, they might have moved up toward that. But nobody's base right now is actually minimum wage fifteen uh, at uh, fifteen dollars at a so-called livable wage. Correct. The 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 uh, the group that had not been moved out of that um, below fifteen dollar wage was the seasonal team. That was what I shared to the commissioner. So the seasonal, uh, the okay, seasonal season, team, yes. yeah, that has been fixed and has been so that when we open positions beginning in, in the spring to hire out our seasonal staff, we will have them at $15. I know, Commissioner, you had asked which positions and uh, were at the um, $9 rate, uh, rate and moved to 15 um, I will have those built into the budget so you can see the change over time, especially at mid-year and this change. Another conversation I want to make sure and share to you all is what happened this week with our dispatch team. Our dispatch team wages were pretty pretty significantly behind and we were a very um, much at a place of high risk. Uh, already we were at the 12-hour shifts which we have not had to implement with our police department where there is all, you know, there's ongoing concern around staffing, but the, the critical place is our dispatch system. And we hit that. I reached out to our friends in the county and requested that we go ahead and start the movement of that team into the 21% increase. They are so far behind, which they agreed to. I, I say that we moved, uh, that request was made because the county, uh, provides the dollars for that group through the um, mill that is related to public safety. So those dollars are not operational dollars of the city. Those dollars are county dollars related to the mill that's related to public safety. So I want to make sure you knew that we were in a, a pretty critical place with our dispatchers and um, that will be implemented ASAP. So I, I appreciate what you've done there. Uh, city manager. So let me just then clarify, make sure I've got it right. Um, everybody at dispatch, minimum wage, base wa wage is $9.20 an hour. Um, and as that $9.20 worked its way through the matrix, that total cost to the county, I guess, in a mill is a 21% increase. Is that correct? That is a, that is a reasonable uh, assessment. Oh. I, I'll ask also if um, the finance director, Sheila, if you wanted to um, lay it out differently as well, um, in total, that differential, is it a 21 across total? Or would you say it's really, because the dollars by way of um, benefits that play out in that change also, so it, it may be a, a different conversation. So I'll let Sheila show that. Thank you, City Manager. Um, Commissioner Fever, um, Mayor and other commissioners. Um, so I was working with the police, interim police chief Brett Petty on the calculation of the impact of um, the increase to the dispatchers and they'll be requesting um, about $218,000 more a year. Um, that's inclusive of the how 
how the benefits um, are impacted by the wage increases as well, such as FICA, Medicare, um, liability, et cetera. So those things are increased, you know, PERS, retirement contributions all increase as well. So for that group of folks to include this um, two, two supervisors in that area, the impact was a little over $200,000. Is that a percent increase? What's that percent increase? Um, sorry, I, if you'll give me a second, I'll bring that up. So Mr. Mayor, I do have a, a continuing question here, if I may, when she was ready. Yeah, we still have an agenda. I just want to remind you guys that um, it's okay to ask your questions, but you must be mindful that we have an agenda to complete. It, it won't take long. No, no, that's fine. Okay. I'm just reminding you. Normally he has to tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, do you want to go ahead and ask it? Well, I, I just, if I follow this along, uh, it is your hope so far as you are able through the budget process to move employees to $15 as a base salary where they are not now. Uh, and that's just, uh, maybe you don't want to answer that now, but uh, that would seem to be what I heard you say. Uh, meanwhile, you did make significant improvements in the dispatch uh, by just simply bringing base to $9.20. And uh, that was a costly item, but one that I applaud. And I do thank you very much, city manager, for taking care of that uh, circumstance where we had people leaving as fast as we were hiring them. Um, and I think, you know, compensation does make a difference. And in this case, I hope it makes a difference that we could show a good retention of dispatch here in six months as we can measure things out. So that was really my question. Mr. Mayor, I will not ask another question about employee compensation tonight. <laughs> I will hold you to your word. Sheila, did you have that percentage? Yeah, just the, the total impact comes to about 17% um, um, over the prior year budget. So um, where we were at with the prior year budget, and that's because medical and, and, and um, dental and vision and um, those things don't have any, they don't change along with wages. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we're ready, I'll move us to the next piece, which is the city manager orientation. Um, I know, Mayor, I want to be conscious of your concern around timing. We are planning to go to six o'clock still. Is that correct? We'll see how the agenda goes. We'll see how everything goes. Um, it should be at six. Okay. But I just want to make sure that we're hitting six and I'll, I'll be conscious of not uh, over jabbering. I, a lot of the content actually is something that we hit um, with our um, trainer, Dan Clark. So. Uh, I'll just quickly go through just a high level again, re really kind of a revisiting, and then um, ask if you have any questions. So just big picture again, Montana's constitution shares this, that um, our, as a local government entity, we are a constitutional shared rule, local government. We're not a home rule, local government home rule would, um, mean we had come uh, really the, the autonomy on our, for example, subdivision regulations or zoning. Those are things that are not uh, on the home rule side. Those are actually shared rule with the state. They help set those subdivision rules, for example. Um, we are a city charter form of government. And uh, within the city charter, it outlines the role of the city manager. And then within that uh, charter, also the commission and how we all uh, work together. And then uh, last, the city code also sets out which departments exist and, and how they exist and, and, the, and their roles in particular. Um, the beauty of the system that is Helena is that um, it is one of the fav my favorite kinds of local governments to be engaged in because it is uh, not one section of town that prevails. It's not one elected person or party and it everyone serves at large. Uh, you all are... Um, serving the entire community, which is pretty special and, and pretty great um, voices uh, to have. So 
thank you very much for hiring me as your city manager to be in that space because it is such a cool uh, place to, to work from when, when everyone's all working at large. The um, city commission really sets that big picture strategy for us. We implement the strategy through the work plan and then fund the work. Just in general, the organization itself, there's 12 departments, um, 368.13 full-time employees, and our uh, fiscal year 22 budget was $97.7 million, and that's across all funds. Our operational priorities um, citywide were really based on um, what actions we've seen over the last year, as well as integrating the, the feedback from our, our team and um, from the director. So work-life balance, stabilizing our staff, creating some consistency and direction, and really implementing that fiscal stability and relationships and community trust. So that stability really um, for our, our staffing does relate very much to that full compensation picture. Just as a reminder, when the commission brought me on, I had the really clear communication from you all that there's a focus on relationship building and that between strategy and organization and financial and fiscal stability, these are the two equal weighted three parts primarily that stood out. So those have been those 13 goals in 16 months. Those are the real areas that I've been focusing in on. Um, just a quick overview of the staffing. I, I want to point out one item. You'll see the, uh, this, this is in the um, budget itself at a higher level. Um, obviously, the citizens of, of Helena, um, elected officials, uh, the city commission, um, the, the boards and committees that you all create to help inform you. We have staff that do provide liaison back and forth and supporting. Um, also, the clerk of the commission and the office of the commission. And then separately, the Helena Citizens Council. The council itself is an independent board. It's an interesting, and I, I really have to say a pretty really not common um, activity in other cities. There's, uh, I say that having my experience as a, a local government leader in another state, but also across the nation in conversations that I've been privy to in my career. So, um, and last, an elected official group of the municipal court judge. That municipal court judge does, and I, I wanna uh, point out the distinction here, the court judge actually does not supervise the court clerks or the clerk, the operations. The operations side reports to the city manager, along with um, the city attorney, human resources, finance, community facilities, police, fire, community development. These are all of the separate departments. We do have a joint city county information technology. That group actually um, works as employees of the county and they um, provide support to the city as well. Meetings. So one of the out, outlines of the charter is that the, the manager sets the agendas for the city commission meetings. You'll see on this agenda, one of the things that was integrated last year based on the really the working retreat that took place with the commission was that there was a, a need to ensure not only did the staff and the team complete the work that was asked of it during commission meetings, but also identify uh, what would be coming up. So on the agenda at the end, you'll see there's an opportunity for you all to identify uh, items for the agenda. That's where I would take those and add them to future agendas. But the intention is uh, between a, an administration meeting and a full commission meeting, a cadence of study and then action, study and then action. So that we're doing a, uh, our job of bringing as much information as we can during these administrative meetings for you to study what ultimately needs to be acted upon later. Um, this, this process of um, adding an item to an agenda was something it moves, uh, agendas really are intended to move um, your priorities forward. And um, as the new commissioners, um, Beaver and Reed joined us, I had put in front of each of the items on that agenda, a relationship to your strategic outcomes. Those strategic outcomes were adopted for the budget and the budget integrates the actions of the team. So the budget itself um, outlines 
in, in its own separate way how we achieve your strategies. Um, there's the, the process that uh, we had suggested previously for adding items is really similar to the bylaws. And also, if there's a, a new item that had been, excuse me, an item that had already been approved in the past and needed to be brought forward again, that the commissioner can introduce it under the questions and comments section of a full commission meeting um, in support of the mayor and two additional members agreeing that that item come forward. And, and you all have, have utilized that method and already. So I just wanted to make sure that I hit on that. I know there was questions. How do I add things to the agenda? How do I set directions? So just to try and get us used to doing it, um, setting the agenda should be part of that um, strategic goal setting, that strategic outcome setting with you all. And then we bring the budget forward to support it. Also, if there's a new item that's outside of the budget and outside of that work plan, it's contemplated in those public meetings and added to agenda. Just a quick reminder, these are the strategic outcomes for the fiscal year 22 budget. These were uh, the results of a working retreat. Um, oftentimes, retreats are uh, both um, relationship building and working. In the case of this, this one, this was a, a working retreat. It was a quick retreat specific to aligning how we can move forward work uh, and move forward the actions of the team so that the commission could interpret what we're doing in relationship to your own goals. So that's these larger three strategic outcomes. Underneath them are the actions that we are focused in on within the work we're doing. So for example, um, diversifying our economic activity and improving the economic vitality of the community. While we don't have economic development staff, uh, I, for example, and the team in the city manager's office leap in in those, those gaps to address them. Um, as well, the, um, the larger space of the, um, and we've been talking about the redevelopment agency, that redevelopment agency um, and its actions are also part of this um, redevelopment on private property and sustainable and infill. There's just a, a layering of all of our work across each of these in, inputs. And then last, um, just a, I wanted to just share to you all a quick example of how um, new development works. And it just is a simplification of the relationship between um, policy work by the commission, operational implementation work, and then um, how you all actually see it in the community. So quickly, high level new development, and I know we've, we've kind of gone through this exercise already. So the development, Montana state law, big picture, uh, subdivision law, state shared rule with the city. They also have the Montana state policy around growth. So we have the city growth policy, which responds to the state's growth policy. Our development policies are responding to the state's development law policies. We use the city charter and the bylaws, and you all approve annexations and asks um, in, within development and redevelopment. We also, you all agree to fund operations and support of those activities that help move forward um, annexations. So planners, for example, um, uh, our building operation, our building team um, for building review permits. And the next in the, uh, the Helena City Commission itself also has a role in its own laws. And I describe them as those policies that move us from um, safety and, and liability, uh, livability are really the primary areas within your strategic outcomes that relate to new development and the growth policy, the uniform fire code, city code and engineering standards, all are policies adopted by the commission that support new development. And then last, um, we implement. So the city manager implements the work. So we review the new development. We provide the plan for review for you all before it comes in front of you. We identify any operational needs into the future. Uh, we uh, provide assurance of compliance with the state, uh, with the state and also the city codes, and inspect those new developments. The intention always being to reduce risk. And then we are, then we finally actually operate what's what's off, offered in that area. So the new development, in the case of the new development, we provide water and sewer, we 
provide roads and trails and parks and law enforcement and emergency response. These are all operational act actions in response to just this new development. Um, some other interesting things that the commission resolves to do through resolutions. So resolutions are often used as the transparency piece of those actions where um, we're sharing to the community what we resolve to do, but they're not actually full policy. So they're not laws, they're, they're resolutions. They're things that we say, yeah, we're gonna do this and we, we like it. Uh, the downtown urban renewal plan, for example, that is not uh, an actual law. The downtown master plan, not a law. Um, complete streets, streets policy. Now, the interesting thing and that I've learned uh, working with Thomas who um, we'll share more on Monday about Thomas, but uh, wonderful. I'm so thankful for Thomas's advice and specifically around resolutions. In Montana, the use of resolutions is also by law and used as law. So there are some places where, in fact, when we pass a resolution, we're passing a law. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll point those out as we go through them in the um, agenda memos as we, as we do the work with you all. Um, last, these are some of the other master plans. So these are these are policies, but they're they're really plans. These plans effectuate the operations. I know there's been lots of conversations around how many plans do we have to have. Well, the, the, the plans really do actually set out um, by you what we will do, and if we're following those plans, then we're doing the work that you've asked us to do. And last, um, I'll work with you all uh, to set a, a strategic planning retreat. I had shared that uh, during the last um, uh, orientation conversation that you all had together, the conversation around having a strategic planning retreat. Uh, the retreat would be great to have. Uh, I know we haven't had uh, a relationship-based uh, retreat. It would be great to have um, the city commission and the directors so that you all could uh, form a relationship with our directors um, who implement with the team, but to also understand this is a new group of commissioners if you wanted to focus in on having a retreat that was focused on uh, not only uh, relationship building among you all, but also the, stru the strategy, the actual work related to the strategy. So um, my suggestion and uh, was is that um, the commission work together in setting a date for a uh, six, uh, four to six hour working retreat with a relationship um, as well, that you're evaluating whether or not the current strategic outcomes for the fiscal year 22 budget are the ones that you wanna continue with. And then also if there are revisions to underneath those strategic outcomes, the actual actions, the goals, the objectives, if those need to change, we talk about those at the retreat. I was really contemplating not changing them. I know Commissioner Jean, you said, well, those apply. I think when we talked about this before, those apply just already that we haven't confirmed that, but I, I don't disagree that uh, we have had so much uh, work that we're, we're doing and much of our stability work, fiscal stability work is gonna take three years and, lotter, and then larger picture, some of the, uh, the larger stability and resilience work is going to take seven to 10. So to do that, really have to have an, uh, uh, an understanding of where we're going over a longer period of time, as opposed to the agility of a, a year to year change. So um, I was also in that same idea, uh, Mr. Jean, I appreciated that that point that you, you and I might have actually had, uh, why are we doing something different? Or maybe we don't need to, and maybe we should just start, start from that space. So I'll again, send out uh, that recommendation to you all and you can decide if you would like to, um, how you would like to frame your agenda and how you would like to run that um, for the retreat and strategic planning. Thank you, Mayor. Then um, that brings us to 5.15 and I won't spend too much more time on um, the overview of just kind of the basics of the city manager. Do you have any questions? Thank you. That completes yeah. my report. At this time, do we have comments or questions from the commission? Do you have any public comments on the topic above? Mad Madam Clerk, do we have any public comments on the topic above? Uh, Mayor and commissioners, I have no hands raised online. I have no written public comment in the Q&A. 
Okay, thank you. City Clerk update. Board application review, HOMAC, HBAC, Railroad TIF, City Commission, Ad Hoc, Solid Waste Steering Committee, City Commission Representative. Madam Clerk. Um, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, good evening. Um, you should have received in your packet the uh, commission memo uh, of the mayor's recommendations for application for the boards listed on your agenda tonight. Uh, these would be the mayor's recommendations. If the mayor would like, he can read the memo aloud for the record. Um, and then, as you all know, these recommendations would be then be moving forward onto Monday's agenda for a formal vote. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, I'm recommending the following board appointments. Helena Open Land Management Advisory Committee, interim appointment of Linda Gilstrip to Lindsay Gilstrip to the Helena Open Land Management Advisory Committee in, in term term will begin upon appointment expires June 30th, 2023. Helena Public Arts Committee, interim appointment of Laura Langdon to the Helena Public Arts Committee as a member at large term will begin upon appointment and expires on December 31st, 2023. Railroad TIF Advisory Board, appointment of Joan Iverson to the uh, first term on the Railroad TIF Advisory Board as a business owner, representative within the district. Non-expiring term will begin upon appointment. City Commission Ad Hoc Committee, Commissioner Emily Dane and Commissioner Melinda Reed. Solid Waste Steering Committee, City Commission Representative, Commissioner Sean Logan. Do you have any comments or questions? Public comments? Department direction feedback. Oh, sorry, Madam Clerk, do we have any public comments? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, commissioners, okay. if you have no questions, there are no public comments at this time. Thank you. Department direction feedback. Uh, Manager Hollishaw, do you have that? Um, I, uh, Mayor, I do believe there should be some information only items. We're not there yet. Oh. I see here department number six, department direction, feedback needed. Oh, I don't have any of those items. I apologize. Oh. I, was, I was skipping to the end. <laughs> Apologies. No, no, no problem. Okay, information only. Discuss waiver of fire tower apartment building and development fees located at 6 and 8 South Park Avenue. Manager Hollishawk, right. Housing Coordinator Kara Snyder. So the information only items on the agenda are items that actually do not require any um, direction from the commission, but they are intended in that cadence of study and then act. Um, and they're intended to bring you up to speed on what might be coming in front of you and allow you to um, formulate questions you might have for either the commission meeting, um, but really this isn't an intention to gain guidance. Um, so uh, I will turn it over to Kara, our housing coordinator, Kara Snyder. You have the flow, Kara. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I just wanna introduce the application from Fire Tower, uh, or I'm sorry, from Wish Camper Development Partners for a building fee waiver um, for fire tower apartments, which is located at six and eight South Park Avenue. Um, and so uh, the Helena City Commission adopted an ordinance in January of 2020 that established the building fee waiver program. Uh, and that was to encourage the construction and rehabilitation of affordable housing projects within the city. Um, this action was in response to a rising need in the community to keep existing affordable housing stock in good condition, as well as to expand housing options for those in need. Um, there are several uh, factors. Um, let's see, I'll grab my notes here. Um, so in making determinations, the commission can consider several factors, including the size of the project, number of persons being served, the financial capability of the applicant to pursue the project without the waiver, length of time the project will be affordable and the manner in which the applicant guarantees the project will remain affordable. 
Um, and so I just want to uh, really briefly introduce the project, which is um, 44 units, all of which will serve households at or below 60% area median income, including three fully ADA accessible units. Um, and we wanted to provide this space for questions and see if we needed to find any additional information for you um, uh, that we could present on the 14th. And then I also wanted to introduce um, a couple people that we have in attendance. So that would be Tyson O'Connell and Lauren Moore, who are representing Wish Camper Development, development Partners. Uh, they should be available to answer any questions um, that would be appropriate for them to answer. And then uh, we also have Kim Mack, who is our chief building official. Uh, so with that uh, being said, um, and I'm also available for questions, uh, but I would like to um, hand it back to you, Mayor, to see if there are questions. Thank you, Kara. Comments or questions from the commission? Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Commissioner. I um, really appreciate um, the brief presentation information um, in the packet, Ms. Snyder. One question I did have um, for uh, next week that might be helpful. I know I, I can't remember the total amount that we've waived so far, but I think it would be interesting to at least just be able to note that in you know the first year and a half of this type of um, program, we've been able to support projects by you know X amount. Um, and I think the large, I know that there were a couple that we did all at once with the Red Alder project and you have it noted here, but um, those amounts would be helpful just to refresh our memories. Thank you. Yep, and I have some uh, general numbers, but I'll track down the exact figures for you. Perfect, thank you. Mr. Mayor, I have a couple of questions, if that's Please all right. Please go ahead, Commissioner. Well, what is the current uh, area media income? Let me pull that up for you. You want to add it to also to the uh, detail for next week too, yes? Yes, I would. If you don't have to answer that tonight, but I would like to know that before we decide on the issue. So maybe these questions can all be, you know, sent around later, so they don't have to be answered. <gasps> Yeah. Uh, second, I can I can speak a little bit to that too. This is Tyson O'Connell, the developer. Um, yeah, but uh, the commissioner say it can be done later. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, it's just good to know. Um, and what are other properties other than Red Alder have we have had full waiver? Or, and I think we said we had a the previous commissioner grant full waiver to the Red Alder uh, project. Is that correct? That is correct, and that's actually um, it's a, a newer initiative, and that's uh, so far been our only application. Uh, right. It has been very successful. I think it's a, it's a very nice project, as is the fire tower project too. So these are Absolutely. not questions meant to skewer anybody. These are just for information. Um, and uh, did we also put conditions on that uh, the red alder? That's um, like six percent of the aid of the. Uh, uh, area median income, and that's 100% of the units. I believe so, and I'll track that down for okay. you for that 14th. I would just want to know on uh, for our meeting on Monday that uh, uh, this looks like that, if that's the way to put it. So the fire tower project looks like the red outer thing. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Do we have any other comments or questions from the commission? All right, we'll move along. Transportation systems, transit update. Manager Hal Shaw, Transportation Systems Director David Kanopke, Transportation Superintendent Elroy Goldman. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. I will turn it over to uh, Director Kanopke. And this is the effectuation of the uh, moving to on on demand transit services and. Uh, this was already implementing. Uh, I want to make sure that you're up to speed as questions come up for um, citizens. Not that there's a, an item coming before you, but that instead you have this information. Um, no action again is required. Thanks, David. It's all yours. You have the floor, Director. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. I'll share my screen real quick. We got a, a couple slide presentation for you. I'll make it quick. Um, <clears throat> So the capital transit update, this is just a brief kind of comparison of our current operation versus demand response. 
We have a combination of buses ranging from 27 passenger to 12 passenger buses down to uh, actually one um, basically Dodge Caravan that's ADA accessible. Um, demand response would use smaller, more versatile um, vehicles, more fuel efficient. Right now, you know, the, the outlook is that the operational hours would remain the same. But looking at the efficiencies that the new software brings um, with uh, scheduling and everything, we're you know hopeful that we might be able to expand those services in the future. Um, that's the same with uh, holiday service. We operate a limited schedule of five holidays. And with the new service, we hope that we can at some point in the future expand um, to allow for consideration of additional days um, again, that's the same. We do not um, provide any weekend service at this time, but again, with this new service and this new capability that uh, the spare software has provided us, we're hopeful that we will, might have, be able to have that conversation in the future with the, with the commission. Right now, we provide two fixed routes, four paratransit routes. Um, paratransit must be approved to use that service, and then one deviated fixed route to East Helena. Uh, with the demand response, there would be no ride qualifications, no need to schedule in advance, 24 hours in advance. Um, ride scheduling right now, there is no mobile app. Um, must they must have they have to call in to schedule or cancel their paratransit uh, rides? With the new demand response model, you can schedule or cancel rides right from your phone, or you can call dispatch, um, whatever everyone is most comfortable with. Um, with our current system, it's cash, coin, or passes. The demand response, we can do a fully automated where everything is an electronic um, transaction or a combination of both. Uh, right now, we do require ADA paratransit applications for basically the door-to-door the -door service of paratransit. With the demand response model, there would be no applications. Um, Thus, just opening it up to, to everyone. Partnerships, currently we have none, but you know, we'd be engaging, seeking public and private partnerships um, to look at um, in conjunction with this new format. So just a brief history back in 2010 to 2013, when Helena operated what, we, what was called Dial-A-Ride, which was, is basically the same as demand response. We were averaging 100,000 or more rides um, annually. 2014-15, the fixed routes were implemented and averaging over 15, uh, 2015 to 2019, our ridership average um, dropped to 83,000 annually. We did have some, um, the graph in the next slide will show there's some capital um, legislative shuttle on odd years. Those would bump us up a bit on those odd years, but right now, the legislative shuttle is, hasn't been used by the, the capital due to um, changes in, in that. And then right now, um, between 20 and 21, COVID, as everyone knows, had a dramatic effect on everyone's lives, including our ridership, which fell to about 25 or 45,000 annually. Um, <clears throat> Transit capital uh, is funded mostly by grants um, from the federal government administered through MDT. So our reduced fare collections did not have a significant impact on that because it's actually a, a small percentage of our, of our operations. And replacing the fixed route system with a demand response model enables Capital Transit to provide service citywide for all um, people wanting to use public transit. You know, this is going to allow those that might live you know, outside the walkable distance of the fixed route system to use this system and to call for a ride when they need one. Um, yeah, school children can get on the bus um, and get picked up, you know, either at a virtual stop where they try to congregate if there's multiple rides in one area, or, you know, it's gonna basically demand response with just door-to-door -door service. Um, so since uh, we started implementing the new software from Spare. Um, 
They switched and scheduling and dispatching the paratransit ridership support has been positive. Um, they've only, we've, we've heard nothing but positive feedback from our paratransit community um, that at the ease of the use of the app. And um, we still have features that are continuing to roll out. Um, this graph just gives you a background of the of the ridership over the years, starting in 2013 um, and dropping off there in 2020 and 21 due to COVID. Uh, as you see, we've we've been on a a, a steady downward trend. Um, so, uh, in response to that, that's where back in 18 and 19, we did several public events asking the public what. Um, what they were interested in, what they wanted to see from transit. And um, overwhelmingly, a lot of the comments came back that they wanted more service. Um, they wanted the door-to-door -door service. And so that's when we started really looking into this model, um, getting the, the finances in place to get the software and then eventually moving to this. So our, our what we're doing now is moving towards 100% universally shared rider um, service using a web-based scheduling and dispatching software that supports user-friendly scheduling, fair payment and collections, and allows for universal access to all user types. Obviously, we can um, we considered staying with our fixed routes. We considered a a combination of the two, but ultimately, to um, capture the most riders, we felt that this demand response, which has been received very well by um, the current users, and I believe uh, we'll see an increase in ridership just because we're going to be servicing areas that haven't been served um, by a, a public transport transit um, unit. This slide just um, kind of goes over those meetings back in 19. Um, we were at the open, open house kickoff at the Capital Transit Facility, the Farmers Market, the Library Walking Mall. We met at the M.E. Anderson building, the Great Northern, again at the Farmer's Market, City County building, St. Peter's Health. And um, the type and number of, of input received, 65 were demand response service, 63 more stops for medical offices, which this would provide. Um, 60 stop at Helena Food Share, 55 availability. So, um, this new demand response model really hits on all those top um, items that were requested by this public um, interaction. So this is just some screenshots of what the app looks like to kind of give you an idea. Um, you know, schedule a ride, tap a button. Where do you want to go? Um, you start with get picked up where, and then share your ride with others going your way. Um, those are just a couple screenshots. There's a lot of uh, flexibility for the riders with this app again, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, Thank Director you. Kanapke. Comments or questions from the commission? Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner. Um, I guess I'm gonna, I'm wondering if maybe we might be able to get maybe like a very brief, even an email of like monthly updates as this is obviously rolling out. I just downloaded the app and it looks like any, you know, ride sharing, which is cool. Um, but I'm, I guess one, if we could maybe get like e monthly email updates as we get more um, accounts and participation, I'd be really interested to see like closer um, data on that. My other question was, and I know I saw this in the work plan spreadsheet that you guys are in the middle of getting the communications plan implemented for this. I guess, how is that being received? And then what are, uh, what are kind of the strategies of the communications plan for this? Because I do think there's going to be lots of people who are very interested. Um, and then hopefully we can maybe start expanding hours as well. Um, Mayor and Commissioners, first off, um, yes, we'll we'll give you up to date. <clears throat> you know whether it's uh, on this information only or an email through the yeah, city can manager. We, can we add it? It's sorry, I'm just going to jump in. 
Can we add it to the uh, lookout so that it's, we can just do that. Is it the lookout that goes out monthly? So everybody, that one goes out publicly too. That I think it's a great idea to add that. I just want to put it there so we all, all see it too in the community too. Sure. Um, and the second is, so we're still in the implementation stage of the software. We're looking at full rollout to the paratransit community with the features that specifically are, are geared towards the paratransit community, um, full rollout and maybe next week. Then we're looking at a couple weeks to test and make sure that the, that portion has bugs because that's basically gonna be just expanded to the, to the greater um, city. So we'll give that a couple weeks. And then um, we were targeting March 21st for the official kind of changeover. And in that time, we were going to be working with the PIO, but <clears throat> we're looking at TV, we're gonna look at radio, newspaper, you know, website, social media, basically the whole kind of blitz so that um, flyers on the buses, flyers at the station, at the transit station, um, and basically anywhere else that we can think that uh, people would be looking at this. We think it, you know, uh, is going to be received well because it only expands those public transportation opportunities for a larger group. And, um, but yeah, I can get a, once we get the fine, the final public communication plan formulated, we can um, okay. pass that along so that everyone knows what um, is going on with that. David, would you, that, that be within the engage or would it, the IAP2 method and matrix identifies the inform um, actions that need to be completed. So we could just have you complete the form and send it to the group. I think you already might have with Jake on yep. the inform so that um, for this item, I know that the IAP2 is specific to the change from um, fixed route to transit. Now it's the communication out of the actual service. So thank you. I just want to thank you because um, I, my questions were answered in your second part when you talked about the publicity of the program, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Any other comments or questions from the commission? Any public comments? Okay. Review of agenda for the next Commission meeting, draft proposed future commission administrative meetings agenda. Manager Hollow Show. Uh, thank you, Mayor. The, uh, today we just were beginning to solidify some of the budget um, project, uh, the projected dates and due dates for the budget. So the, the next um, titles document that you will receive for our next administrative meeting will have those called out a little bit more. I want to note that we're not anticipating any work sessions outside of our already planned meetings that we'll be using admin meetings and commission meetings to uh, do the work sessions for the budget and um, really trying to pace out the actions um, in that way to reduce work sessions and really focus in on uh, after the preliminary budget is introduced, um, which is the city manager's budget, you all get presentations from the directors and then uh, move into the further questions and adoption of the preliminary. The preliminary budget is the one that has to be completed by the end of June. And then the final adopted budget, which is the commission's final budget, actually has to be completed by August. So there's still plenty of time. Uh, and that final adoption includes the uh, resolutions and Commissioner Dean, your um, uh, point about um, carryover will be integrated into that that space as well um, in the final commission adopted budget. Um, so that said, um, are there any items you want to add? <laughs> Thank you. At this time, is there anyone from the public wishes to address the commission? Madam Clerk, do we have any raised hands? Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, I have no hands raised at this time, and I have no written public comment. We'll give them another 45 seconds, and then we'll move forward.
Thank you. Commission discussion and direction to the city manager. Do you have uh, any final comments from the uh, commission? Andrew Howell Shock, I know we didn't have any directions today, but you got it all clear? Way to go. Okay. Thank you. At this time, uh, I apologize. At this time, we will call this meeting adjourned.